here. Proverbs chapter 3, turn there with me. We made our way down through verse 10, so we kind of got to cover new ground starting in verse 11 this morning, and we'll make our way down to verse 26, but it's kind of building um, upon uh, itself as we go along, and we're going to continue to see that this morning. Uh, as we make our way through the book of Proverbs. In fact, why don't I just read the new stuff, verse 11 to 26, and then come back and share with you. So if you're there, verse 11 with me, if you can see that, say amen. 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 All right. <laughs> My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding, for her proceeds are better than the profits of silver and her gain than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things you may desire cannot compare to her. Length of days is in her right hand. In her left hand, riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who hold, uh, who take hold of her, and happy are all who retain her. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth and by understanding established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths were broken up and the clouds dropped down the dew. My son, let them not depart from your eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. So they will be life to your soul and grace to your neck. Then you will walk safely in the way and your foot will not stumble. And when you lie down, you will not be afraid. Yes, you will lie down and your sleep will be sweet. Do not be afraid of sudden terror, nor of trouble from the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. And so, Father, we do thank you this morning, Lord God, that you've given us this text to study. Lord God, as always, I pray that you would speak to us from it, Lord, as only you can by your spirit. Lord, that even at the very moment, you would take away from our hearts and minds things that would draw our attention away from you. And that you would remove the distractions from the room, Lord, that you would call us all, whether in this room or in the lobby or online, to hear what you have to say and be changed and transformed more and more into the image of your son. We love you. We thank you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. And so as we go into this particular section, we're still building upon all of the things that we've already seen, um, not forgetting the law, but keeping his commandments and and we saw that in verse 1, and there were benefits in verse 2, which we'll, we'll mention later on. Um, in verse 3, we saw the, this combination of, of mercy and truth, and that we shouldn't forsake either, but bind them upon our necks, write them upon the table of our heart. Remember, we talked about that. And we'll find favor and high esteem in the sight of man and God. That combination, that balance of mercy and truth, which we've been talking about last week, we learned to trust with our whole heart. And not to lean upon our own understanding. Y'all remember that, right? The, the great memory verse. Y'all remember that, right? Yes. Okay. Um, all of those things, acknowledge them in all our ways and he'll direct our path. These are daily truths. If you go to work, school, wherever, these truths keep you every day in and out when you remember them and you, you meditate on them. And they come up in your heart and mind as the Holy Spirit brings them to your memory. You remember we ended last week in verse 8, 9, where it says... Um, uh, verse, uh, where were we at? Verse 9 and 10, honor, honor the Lord with your possessions. You remember the stuff you already got, your wealth, and with the first fruits of your increase. Y'all remember that? Yeah. And so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new, mind, new wine. Excuse me. And as we end it, we learned about this great life of stewardship that the Lord has called us to honor him in everything that we do with all that we have, with all that we receive, that it all comes from him. He's the source of it and therefore we should honor him with it. Um, so that it doesn't have our heart. That's the big thing, that he has our heart and not things upon this earth having our heart. So you can go back and listen to that the last week if you want. But what that does is all of this stuff is, is building upon us and learning to live with the wisdom of the Lord, which comes from his word, which is very different from the things that come from the world. 
And even even as we learn to first as on a personal level to honor the Lord, to trust the Lord, to keep his commandments, to to meditate upon his word personally, we learn to do this. And it's producing fruit in our lives as we're seeing in Proverbs chapter three. But um, then we learn to do it corporately as we gather as Christians. And this is the thing I want to mention before we go forward this morning, that as a body of believers, and I think the whole church, especially in America, needs to begin to pray about this. But particularly our church, we need to have the wisdom of the Lord and how we do ministry outward. And I think this is going to have to begin to shape the way we view outreach and the way we view missions. Yesterday, um, my son and I had a chance to spend a good amount of time talking with a homeless man um, and just kind of just really wanted to do it differently. I used to do a lot of street ministry. And yesterday, I just listened to the guy. And I knew it was a divine appointment because the guy's name was Kevin. You know, <laughs> it's like God keeps doesn't doing that to me. You remember when I told you the story of giving the guitar away to this Mexican kid whose name was Kevin? I've never met a Mexican named Kevin before. <laughs> and like, what, what, that, that, and it's like, the guy was like, I want you to give it to him. And I want you to bless him. And I want you to encourage him to learn to play. And I was like, okay. And then this guy down, down uh, downtown Raleigh named Kevin, and we were talking to him. And listening to him talk about the, the long process of trying to get off the street. And if you've ever done street ministry, you know that there are difficulties to that. No ID, no address makes it difficult to get good work sometimes. You know, being able to shower. There's all these challenges that go along with that lifestyle. And, and so listening to that, there are those that want to get a leg up, if you will. But even, listen, even the programs provided by the government hinder that process Because what the government doesn't realize, because they don't have the fear of the Lord, that what they are doing is creating dependence, which is actually what they like. A big government likes dependence. And so because of that, they don't actually have the ability, just like with the flawed welfare systems that they created 100 years ago almost now, they don't have the ability to bring about real strong, lasting change in their programs. But the church does. Because of the fear of the Lord and the wisdom of the word, we actually have the ability to do that. So listening to him talk is very evident that the last thing that people need is for like us to show up with just handouts. Everybody does handouts. But what they need, especially those who want to step up, is to be the balance is the between. And here it is. The mercy and truth, let not mercy and truth forsake you. Remember we talked about that? Well, in this case, it comes in again. Mercy and truth is the mercy to provide the practical, but making sure that this spiritual is poured in, not just in a one-time setting, but in a way that continues to pour in things that can help them then take the step up. And that's discipleship. Kind of like what we see down in Atlanta. Atlanta is a shelter that provides food, clothing, shelter, but it's a discipleship program. It's, it's pouring in and giving tools to those who want to get up. And so I think the church is going to have to grow in this because as we see this final global government that we learned about in the book of Revelation developing before our very eyes, what we as Christians are going to have to do is begin to a little bit check out from the system. And I want to say be self-sufficient, but just be more Christ-sufficient meaning that we are completely dependent upon the Lord and independent from the world system and particularly the government. Because the government's going to come for your ability to function the way the Bible has called us to. Uh, At some point, I was talking with a brother between services, even as it says, the first fruits of your increase. Um, and, And, you know, when you think about the first fruit, the ability that God put in everything, the seed to reproduce itself, And even big government has taken that ability away, controlling the pharmaceutical industry, controlling what type of seeds can actually be grown, controlling all these things because this is the world system. The wisdom of the Lord would say to those who have the fear of God, I've called you to live differently in every single way possible. What we look, the church should look completely different from the world in almost every way. Um. Is that like a health thing? Okay, y'all help, help, help her out, y'all. It's okay. There you go. All right, you got it, Miss Bridget. I'm a, you know, it can be difficult sometimes, you know. And so I'm gonna start equipping the ushers with hammers. 
And you just like, just raise your hand next time. Like, I can't, you know, they'd smash, you know. Um, but I do think that there is wisdom from the Lord in the final days that Christians need to be mindful. Like, hey, what does the Lord say about these things, these situations? How should we conduct ourselves in a different way so that the, the, you know, the people that God wants to minister to have the ability to hear what he has to say and grow? And so as we continue now in this whole learning the wisdom from the book of Proverbs, we pick it up in verse 11. And verse 11 says, my son, as we read earlier, do not despise the chasten of the Lord, nor detest his correction for whom the Lord loves. He corrects just as a father, the son in whom he delights. And so you can read that. And there's two sides of this. And often we pick up on the wrong side. We pick up on, you know, punishment and harsh discipline from a father. And maybe that's because some of us had earthly fathers that possibly were that way. I don't know. But if you really listen to the verse, it seems to be coming from a place of a fatherly love. And that's what I want you to catch. But let's look at the verse closely. It says, don't despise the chastening of the Lord. This word chastening, actually, we think correction, we think discipline, we think um, in a harsh way, but it means literally to check and to teach. It means, to, it means doctrine, actually. It's actually translated that way. It's, it's translated, it, the biggest translation of it in the Bible over 30 times is instruction. So do not despise the instruction and do not despise the doctrine or the teaching. Do not despise the discipline, which is the training of the Lord. That's the first thing we see here. And that paints a different picture because, you know, chastening has this beautiful, beautiful part of it that we can often miss. Paul said to the church when he was writing that I want to present you as a chaste virgin before the Lord. How many of you all remember that verse? In other words, Paul is saying, I want to pour God's word on you so much, the teaching and instruction from his word. I want to keep it before you constantly so that it can train you the right way so that I can present you back to the Lord as a chaste virgin. A chaste virgin is someone who is blessed because she's been kept She's been protected. She's been by a father who provides security and safe place for her. She's been provided the training and, and, the, and the instruction of older women in her life that she can come up and be this amazing godly woman. That means everything had to be provided for her so she could get to that place, you know, so that when her wedding day comes, she's got her boxes of fragrant oils and perfumes and she's ready for her wedding. She's a chaste virgin. She has nothing to be ashamed of. On her wedding day, Paul says he wants to bring the church to that place to present her before Jesus. And so then when we begin to look at verse 11, it's different than we might think, because to be chased is to be cared for. To be chased is to be provided for. To be chastened is to be nurtured and trained in the right way. And so he's saying, do not despise the chastening of the Lord and then notice or detest his correction. That's the other side. Part of the training, part of the discipline, part of the teaching is what this other word correction means, which is to rebuke. So that means that there is that side of correction where you have to be told when you're wrong in order to then be led in the right direction. So you got both sides of that in this verse. But what you can't miss is the second part, verse 12, for, the, uh, for whom the Lord, what y'all? Loves, he corrects, just as the Father, the Son, in whom he delights. So it's from a place of love and delight that the Lord has for you that he actually provides this chastening and this correction. Job said it this way, Job 5, 17 says, Behold, happy is the man whom God creates, uh, corrects. Happy means blessed. Happy means um, overjoyed. Therefore, do not despise the chastening of the Almighty. In other words, the, the person who's been chastened by the Lord is blessed and overjoyed. But, it, you know, there's some difficult, there's some, I guess, some uncomfort that comes along with it to get you to that point. And let me read it to you from Hebrews chapter 12. The writer of Hebrews is actually quoting from the Old Testament, from the book of Proverbs. But I'm going to read you the whole account starting in verse 5 where it says, And uh, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. Uh, the writer of, of Hebrews writing to the Hebrew Christians who were thinking about turning away from the faith because it was a little too hard. 
Now, this is something that American Christians haven't learned yet. The Iraqi Christians know. The Chinese Christians know. The Iranian Christians know. The Nigerian Christians know. We don't know. Okay? And that's just the way it is. So he says, you have forgotten exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him for whom the Lord loves. He chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. It's because he delights and loves the son that he chastens him. And then it says, and even Jesus, the Bible says that he learned obedience through the things he went through. That's crazy to think that God in human flesh had to go through some things. But it says on um, verse seven, look on the screen. It says, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? I mean, if he really loves the son, he will chasten the son. You know, the world, the world says that if you discipline children, you will mess up their psychological health, you know. And what the Bible tells us is that if you don't do it, you will mess them up psychologically because they won't be fit for society. Now you see them, you know, looting and burning down things and pushing to have their way in every way that they want for anything that they want without, with no control. Paul said, well, you know, things are going to go in that direction in the last days, you know. So anyway, he goes on to say, but if you are without chastening, verse 8, notice, of which all have been partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Uh-oh. In other words, if there is no chastening of the Lord in your life, I'm going to come back to this, then you don't belong to the living God. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a, a few days chastened us as it seemed best to them. In other words, they didn't even do it the best the best way they were just doing it as they could figure out. But he who but he for our profit, meaning God did it for our profit, for our good, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been uh, trained by it. Two things from that section really quick. One, if there's no chastening in your life, then you don't belong to the Lord. OK. And two, it doesn't feel good when we're going through it. But afterwards, it produces fruit in our lives. OK, you catch that. Now, listen, what's this chastening like? Well, it begins often. Listen, and this is how you can know you belong to him as well. Chastening of the Lord, the training, the teaching, the, 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 the discipline, it begins with just the conviction of the Holy Spirit on the inside. And the Bible says if you have not the Holy Spirit, Romans chapter 8, right around verse 9, then you don't belong to him. So therefore, if you are born again, meaning you're saved, because you can't be saved and not be born of the Holy Spirit. Okay, we're all good on that. All right. Moment you're saved, the Holy Spirit fills your life. OK. Um, and I, that's another teaching, I guess, too, that needs to be dealt with at some point as it comes up in Scripture. It's Calvary Chapel. We'll get there. We'll get to everything as long as the Lord tarries because we're going to continue to go through the Bible. Amen. You OK. All right. So the Holy Spirit in you begins to convict you of sin and go on the wrong way. And the Holy Spirit is God within you because there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is just like God the Father. Same nature, same character. Um, it's a he, he's a he, excuse me. Um, he's involved in creation, involved in resurrection, involved in everything, okay? And you can grieve him, all right? And so he is constantly trying to, and the Bible says he actually yearns jealously for you. So the Holy Spirit, who's now been placed over your life, is trying to lead and guide you constantly to Christ. See, the law for the Old Testament was the tool master, if you will, that led them to the point of knowing that they were sinners in need of salvation. But now the Holy Spirit in us leads us into all righteousness, and we literally fulfill the law in the Spirit of God. Okay, everybody with me? That's why we don't need the law anymore. We're not under it in that way. It's not bad. It's good, but we don't need it because the Spirit of God convicts us every time we get out of line, okay? It's like having the teacher go home and live with you. That's literally what's happening. The Holy Spirit went home and lived with you. 
So now he, he can tell you when nobody else even knows you're doing wrong. Hey, you know what? You're grieving me. You need to slow down. You need to back up from that. So it's, it's, it's all the urges on the inside that come from God. That's the chastening. That's the training. That's the no, don't go there. Go this way. No, let's come back. You know that person doesn't mean you any good. Be careful with that. You dabble with that and it's going to get you. You know, it's, he's talk, the Holy Spirit is talking to you. All right. But then often we don't listen to the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so then, therefore, there is the other part of chastening, the uncomfortable aspects of God maybe having to put you in a very difficult situation to get your attention, to close a door, to make the way a little bit more difficult than it needs to be because he's trying to draw you in the right direction. And he's trying to he's trying to keep you close to him. And so even with that, then there are things that he sometimes withholds from us. Because those very things that we want, if he gave them to us, would destroy us. We've talked about that. So he doesn't put things in your life that's not good for you or that will stumble you and draw you further away from him. So what happens is we begin to realize that as children of God, we're not free to do everything the world is doing anymore. Because that's not what God may have for us. And so he's trying to lead us in a different way because we are chaste children. We're not just reckless children of wrath that can do anything they want. It doesn't matter anyway because they're on their way to hell in a handbasket unless they repent and turn to Jesus Christ. And that's the reality. And so he's saying here to us as we look at the verse again, 11 and 12, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Don't want to get out from under his, his correction because it's for our good. For whom the Lord loves, this is the thing. He corrects just as the father, the son in whom he delights. So when that correction, when that discipline, when the chastening effect, the sanctification process is evident to you, then that that moment is telling you that you are the beloved of the creator of everything that we could ever imagine. I would say the universe, but so much more. He loves you so much at that very moment that he placed his spirit within you and gave you his word that he may discipline and chase you and make you into something and produce fruit in your life. Okay, y'all with me? Okay. So then we see that it continues to produce fruit and results in our lives as we now look at verse 13 through 18, where he says, happy is the man who finds wisdom. Now, again, that word happy means blessed. Oh, how blessed and overjoyed is the man who who finds wisdom. Wisdom is going to be personified again here in the feminine. And so what we've seen is that wisdom literally, and we'll see it over and over and over, that the wisdom is the very living word of God itself. I should say himself because Jesus is the living word. Okay. And and wisdom and understanding is also being able to take that knowledge gained from his word and apply it in our lives. Remember that. That's where we've been so far. So how blessed and overjoyed is the man or the woman who finds this treasure of God's word and the ability to apply it in his or her life. Because it says in the man who gains understanding, because notice what it says in verse 14 for her, meaning uh, wisdom, the, the pr- her proceeds, the proceeds of wisdom is the language here are better than the prophets of silver. And her gain than fine gold, and these things are extremely precious upon the earth. I'm amazed at how, um, you know, you could throw diamonds here. Diamonds seem to have gone up like 10% every year. You know, I uh, remember when I was getting engaged, and that was the only time I've ever bought any diamonds, you know, because I, I don't really like wearing that stuff. You know, I, I, I'm going to break it or lose it. You know, I just... Because I'm going to get outside and dig in the dirt and lose thousands of dollars, you know. So I just don't wear this stuff. That's for pretty boys, in my opinion. Okay. <laughs> I, I you ain't going to catch me with no necklace and, and, and all that kind of foolishness, you know. However, I, I have a ring because it symbolizes something that's very special to me. Okay. So I have the ring and I've kept it all these years. And that, so, um, but diamonds have gone up. As I've told you, gold has more than quadruple since I remember when I first started. I remember gold was like $300 an ounce and it was $700 an ounce. Um, last week it hit $1,800 an ounce. I mean, it's crazy um, that you get into all of these things. And, and, and so we understand these precious stones are very valuable. We've talked about that. But again, the treasures that come from knowing and learning and applying the word of God to your life far exceeds those things. It's something that will never perish. 
And so it says in verse 15, she is more precious than rubies. And all the things you notice may desire cannot be compared to her. So your, your, your greatest desire of things upon this earth, y'all, think about that for a moment. Are y'all doing okay? Yes. Y'all want something. Everybody in here wants something. America is the land of wealth. It's amazing how people want to complain about America and everybody's still trying to get here. <laughs> and ain't nobody really leaving. You ever thought about that? Ain't nobody leaving because it's still, uh, you know, anyway. So, and stay focused. All right. So anything that you could desire upon this world, the Bible is saying, and, and I know it's hard to imagine. So Pastor Kevin, this is not making a lot of sense. Maybe because you haven't tested it yet. What the Bible is saying is that the treasure found in the word of God being applied in your life is going to give you more than all of those things that you can imagine. And as we've talked about before, think about all the NBA basketball players who, are, who had million dollar contracts who are bankrupt. Okay. Think about all the people who won the lottery who are now bankrupt. Uh, somebody showed me that somebody went to get their lottery ticket. Uh, they went to get their lottery winnings with the mask on, um, like a full face mask, so their family members wouldn't know who they was and their friends. Because, you know, as soon as people know who ain't talked to you in three years, find out you won the lottery, all of a sudden you get the phone calls and stuff like that and everything starts. But these people go broke. They end up worse off than they were before because without the wisdom of the Lord and the chastened life of becoming a steward, then it's just going to be spent upon the flesh and wasted anyway. So he's saying that there's something greater than all of that. And she's more precious than rubies and all the things that you might desire and lust after cannot be compared to her. Notice again in verse 16, and I, I'm not going to tell you I fully understand these things, but it keeps coming up in Scripture. So it's something we need to consider. Notice length of days is in her right hand. Really? Length of days. Well, wait a minute. Remember verse 2? Verse 1 says, don't forget the law. Let your heart keep the commandments. Verse 2, for length of days and long life and peace it will add to you. Length of days, long life, peace. Aren't those three good sounding things? Okay. Do you remember in verse 8, it will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones? Do y'all remember these things? And then now we get to verse 16, length of days are in her right hand. How? Well, we've already talked about this. This is the third week, and I won't go into it again. But what's produced from the wisdom found in the scripture of God's word, which is what we're talking about through the Lord Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit, provides you a substance, if you will, a, a, a provision, if you will, um, a level of peace, a level of joy, a level of, of living life a certain way that it does increase life expectancy and health within us. And I'm not just saying that everybody who, who's walking with the Lord is just going to live to be 100 years old. No, that's not the point. But the quality of life shoots up, and that's proven scientifically. Whereas not having these things and only having the stress and anxiety which comes with life, and even those who get rich in this life who don't know the Lord are under intense stress on how to keep it and how to deal with everybody that's after what they got. And they never really experience a peace with any of it. And so there's something that happens with the physical being of our lives when we come to this place and in her left hand, riches and honor. We still see these things. Now, one thing we know is for sure is that we gain eternal life. Amen. So we know that the book of Revelation says we're going to live in the new city of Jerusalem. Nothing um, uh, evil will enter in. There'll be no more crying. We'll be sustained forever. But these are things that begin even now. Notice her ways are ways of pleasantness. And all her paths are peace. Now, I, I, you know, maybe if you would be honest and you would look and think about your life and how God led you away from certain ways, certain paths that you were on. And you can look at those who continued down those paths and continued in those ways and look at what they're going through and how the Lord has preserved you. You follow what I'm saying? When I look at my, most of my frat brothers from back in the day, marriages ended in divorce. It is hard. They're going through stuff because the ways they continue in were ungodly ways and the paths were not paths of peace. And, and, I, and I can compare, not to be comparing, but I can simply say, Lord Jesus, thank you. Because I don't, you know, I, I don't, I was a knucklehead 
And somehow, thank you. I don't even know. I just have to thank him. I don't even know because I know I ain't smart enough to walk away from stuff. Sin is fun. He loves me. His word is true, right? This is what I'm trying to say. His ways are ways of pleasantness. All his paths are paths of peace. And peace is something that we don't want to live without. And it comes from being close to him. And we find it through the wisdom and of the scriptures of his word. Plus, the Holy Spirit, as we then grow in him, produces these things. Because peace is one of the fruits of the spirit. We know that, right? Y'all know that, right? Y'all know fruit is the result of a process that God has already put in place. You put the seed in the ground, then the seed with the moist ground germinates and does exactly what it was designed to do because God created everything with its seed within itself. And it, it shoots roots and sprouts up and then that grows and then fruit comes from that. Well, literally, the fruit of walking with him, the fruit of finding our treasure in his word, the fruit of, of being born again will produce peace in our lives. And so then notice in verse 18, he says, and she is, notice, a tree of life to those who take hold of her and happy are all who retain her. Now, there's a big picture in verse 18, again, which I don't fully understand as Solomon is writing and meditating on all of these truths. Solomon was poured into consistently. I'm sure by his father, because it seems as I read through the Old Testament that Solomon was young when David was old. And that's always makes for a really good combination because old people want to pour out all of their wisdom upon whoever will listen. And young people are the ones who usually listen to the old people. Children like listening to the grandparents. They, it's like it's this natural thing. Y'all ever notice it? Grandparents and children, it's like they're exactly the same. <laughs> they're exactly the same they, they 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 both drool they make mistakes you know <laughs> they're a little wobbly sometimes you know but they get along they, they're really good I'm not trying to be I'm just saying they they make the perfect companions God designed it that way because the, the the children are sponges and the old people want to pour everything that's in them out and so that's why God meant for it to be that way. And so Solomon was soaking up all of these things, Bathsheba pouring into him, all having regrets. Probably I can think about Bathsheba having regrets of the mistakes she made and, and what happened to Uriah and David with all of his regrets. And in their old age, they're just pouring everything in and everything in. And here Solomon soaked it up. And then the Lord gave supernatural blessing to his wisdom. And he says, she, wisdom, herself personified, which is literally the Lord Jesus, the living word, is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. And in other words, we remember the tree of the life in the Garden of Eden was put there to sustain life forever in the original creation. But sin destroyed it. Y'all know that, right? We see the tree of life again at the end of the Bible in the new city, Jerusalem, to sustain those on the new earth. Y'all remember that, right? These are the two bookends, if you will. And here he's saying that in the middle, she literally becomes a tree of life for us, meaning that this wisdom found in the Lord, uh, in, in the word of God, and in the Lord will literally be a sustaining factor in our lives. And happy, blessed are all who retain her. And so he's calling us to something, and I won't run out of time here, that there's certain levels of peace. There's certain levels of, of, uh, of, of, of pleasantness. There's certain level of, of even physical health and mental health that can only come from this closeness with the Lord found in his word and by his spirit. There's certain things you can only tap into by spending time with him. Medication is not the end all be all. The doctors and psychiatrists are not the end all be all. The, 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 the finding the wealth of this world is not the end all be all. The best financial planner, the best decisions made at the right time and, and, and you know, get in when the market's right and all this kind of stuff and all that stuff that goes along with it is not the end all be all. Solomon, the wisest and one of the richest men, the men to ever live upon the earth is telling you that it's found in the wisdom of God's word. In verse 20, uh, 19, notice he goes on here and he says, it's very interesting. He says, the Lord, by wisdom, founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. Now, we know that the way the Lord created everything, according to what we know, is that he spoke it into existence. 
by wisdom he did it. I get the sense that what we now, well, well, this is fallen, so let's not talk about what we see. But what it was before the fall was in God before he did it. And, you know, and we understand this to this degree. Check this out. We're made in the image of the living God, right? Okay. Unlike anything else, well, I'll come back to that. He has put in us these things. Many of us are craftsmen. And so the things we create, you know, whether you, you paint or you build or you, you do floral arrangements or you, you, you knit or you create fabric. I don't know what all the stuff y'all do. OK, a lot of you now design things on computers, but that stuff's in your heart and mind before it actually comes out. Why? Because we're made in the image of our God. Now, side note, I have seen some pretty amazing bird nests this year. And I'm like, man, that's pretty interesting construction. They only have a beak. <laughs> like, I don't know. Right, so God gave them, God created them to do certain things. That's amazing too. But all of that speaks of the wisdom of God that was in God from the beginning. Y'all with me? Okay. So this was all contained within him. And so here, verse 19, it says that the, that the Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. When I mean, you think about his wisdom, his foreknowledge, how he designed it all. Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. So he already knew through foreknowledge that we were going to, Adam was going to sin. We were going to sin. We were going to need a savior. It only could happen a certain way. He wanted to make sure that nobody could come up with any other way. So he wrote the law that only Jesus could fulfill. And, and through his wisdom, he created all of these things. He founded the earth by understanding. He established the heavens. And this is hard to fathom. Jeremiah says in 51, 15, he has made the earth by his power. Well, we know that it had to be powerful for him to say, let there be. And there was. But notice it says he has established the world by his wisdom and stretched out the heavens by his understanding. Again, if you haven't been with us on the Old Testament on Wednesday nights, the heavens were stretched out like a scroll. We understand that. Revelation says it will roll up like a scroll. The fabric of space time is what it's talking about, um, which scientists, they can't get it unless they believe. Psalm 104 verse 24 says, O Lord, how manifold, that means multifaceted, are your works in wisdom, you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. Verse 30 says, you send forth your spirit. They are created. I like that because it puts the Holy Spirit in creation. But the Bible says that Jesus created all things. And the Bible says God created the heavens and the earth. Okay? Trinity created it. Well, the Bible says that God raised Jesus from the dead, but then the Bible says that the Spirit of God in Romans 8 raised Jesus from the dead, but Jesus says that he has the power to raise himself from the dead. So there you go, Trinity creating the new creation of the resurrection. Okay, we understand, right? So all the time in unison, distinct but in unison, in, in agreement, working together. So you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. Hebrews 11 says this, by faith we understand. And this makes no sense. Why would God have to have faith? But by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by, notice again, the word of God. Well, we, that kind of makes sense because he said, let there be, right? Right? And then there was. Jesus is the living word. The Bible says that he created all things. John chapter one in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And there was nothing made that was made except by him. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. And I'll be honest, man, we can't we can't we can't get to the bottom of this in the lifetime that we have. So we need eternity to figure this stuff out. The wisdom or the very word of God spoken has done all of this. And God says, therefore, it is the greatest thing that you can obtain upon this earth. The wisdom found in his word and apply it in your life. And it will produce fruit beyond anything else that this world can produce. And that fruit will be eternal because the things we do in Christ last forever. Remember the Bema seat picture? Jesus says, you'll stand before for me and we'll get things right and, and all your works will be put in the fire. Y'all know these verses, right? And the wood hand stubble, the junk will burn away and only the precious things will remain. It's another object lesson Jesus gives of saying that everything you do in me has eternal value and the things done outside of me will burn up and will not even enter eternity. And so in all the things that we're experiencing and doing, God is saying, no, you find treasure in my word and apply that to your life. 
And then he gives us all of these benefits of it as we go on. Notice it says, verse 20, by his knowledge, the depths were broken up. So verse 19 deals with the creation. Verse 20 deals with its judgment. By his knowledge, the depths were broken up. The clouds dropped down their dew. You know, it does speak of natural processes. But what we know is that after sin, when God judged the earth, Genesis chapter 7, the flood comes in. And how does the flood come in? The depths, the uh, fountains of the deep are broken up. The windows of heaven are open and the earth is flooded. And so even in his wisdom, all of these things come to be. Verse 21. So he says, my son, let them not depart from your eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion so they will be, notice, life to your soul and grace to your neck. Really quick, um, because we're getting short on time. He's saying, look, it will literally be life to your soul. Your inner being sometimes can even be dry. And sometimes when you drift from the Lord, you can have this dryness on the inside. And a lot of times it's because you've, you've been we've been too focused on the things of this world that are all around us and they can swallow us up. And we're worried about what we're going to do, worried about how we're going to get things done and how and all this stuff. And we're focused, focused, focused. And we can become very parched, if you will. So he's saying the very parched ground of your soul can be refreshed when you finally turn back to the word of God. And let it wash over you and the spirit enlighten you and open it up to you. And it can literally refresh and take the parched, dry soul and bring it back to this fruitful life all over again. Because, see, what happens when we drift away from the word of God, we begin to lean unto our own understanding. And when we come back to the word, we realize, no, I need to trust fully in the Lord and lean not into my own understanding. And so he's he's constantly building upon this thing. And then notice what he says. So it will be life to your very soul, your inner being and grace to your neck. Nothing satisfies like the word of God upon this earth. Nothing satisfies like the Lord Jesus and nothing refreshes us like his Holy Spirit working in our lives. But he says then here, look at the benefits. Verse 23. Then you will walk safely in your way and your foot will not stumble. I love that because the Lord can keep you. So when you turn to, you, to his word, when you are applying his word to your life, when you're relying on him and everything, then you can walk safely in the way and your foot won't stumble because you're being guided. Remember, lean not in your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he is the one who directs your path. It builds. So then verse 24, another benefit is the ability to rest. And don't take this one for granted. Check it out. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. Yes, you will lie down and your sleep will be sweet. You know, some people don't get good sleep and they're trying to figure out why. And so they try this product, that essential oil and, you know, change the mattress, change the position, get the new pillow. And, you know, these things are necessary. Okay. See the chiropractor. I mean, we got to do this stuff. I mean, it's, it's, it's tough to get sleep sometime, okay? I'm, I'm just being honest, okay? I, I understand that that can be a very difficult thing. Others, though, there is that physical aspect of it. But the reality, too, though, is that many times you're not getting, you might not be getting the sleep you need because your, your mind is constantly worried about so many different things. And your heart is on so many different things. And, and, and you, are, you are tossing and, and turning in the midst of the night because of things that might be happening the next day, which you don't even have the power to get to the next day of being learning. And you, you, it won't leave you. And you're constantly dealing with all of these things. And so because, listen, because the word of God itself brings you to a place of full reliance on him, where you learn to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not in your own understanding. And when you begin begin to really find your peace in him, because this is challenging some of you here, then you might find the rest that you need. So the question for some of you as you've tried all those other things is that maybe the issue is that you haven't fully learned to trust in him and rest in him spiritually. You know, you're trying to do it on your own, you know, leaning on your own understanding, trying to figure it out. Jesus hasn't called. You know what? Jesus says it over in Matthew chapter 33. Um, 
Matthew chapter 6, excuse me, they're not 33 chapters in Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, right around verse 33 somewhere, he says, um, you, know, you know, take no thought. Remember that? You know, you can't add want no stature to your cubit. He says, sufficient in, in the day is the evil thereof. In other words, Jesus says every day has its own evil stuff to deal with. You, you, you just got through this day, rest. Don't worry about the evil tomorrow. It'll be there if you get to tomorrow. You spend in tonight worried about the evil that belongs to tomorrow. And he's saying, I, I want you to have rest in the midst of the night. And I think that by spending time with him, by allowing the word of God to fully work in your life, and by, look, because the Bible says to him that knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. If you are not trusting and you know it, then right now the Holy Spirit is chastening you and pointing out the fact that you can't rest because you don't trust me in that sin. And he's saying you need to let go of some things and give it to him and let him have it because the Bible is promising that when you lay down, notice your sleep will be sweet. Sweet means it will be nice. It will be enjoyable. It will be refreshing to your soul. And God wants to give you this. Psalm 127, he says he gives his beloved sleep. In Psalm 127, it says it is it's foolish and wasteful to stay up worrying about things when he gives his beloved sleep. So I think the Bible might be calling some of you out. That the issue may not be none of those other things, all those products you're relying on and still haven't gotten the sleep you need. You know, it may be that you need to you need to repent of your distrust in the Lord. Now, notice he says, verse 25 and 26, as we're going to close, he says, do not be afraid of sudden terror, nor of trouble from the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. And I love this. Verse, these verses are very clear to us. God is challenging us through his word and through the wisdom of his word, not to be afraid of sudden terror, things that come suddenly. What's an example of a sudden terror? Well, March 2020, business as usual. And then all of a sudden it gets complicated. The hospital visits get real complicated and you know, they're, they, you know they're, they're beginning to reduce things, and now we're heading into a lockdown. We have sudden terror, okay? And he says, don't be afraid of sudden terror. I'll come back. Nor trouble from the wicked when it comes. Because he says, for the Lord will be when that comes your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. So I use 20, 2020 as an example because we had a sudden terror that came upon the whole world. And, you know, you could really look back and determine where you were when that happened based upon how you responded to all that went on. Can you say that the Lord was your confidence? Can you say the Lord will keep your foot from being caught? Because the next thing that comes, according to Scripture, the world is not going to get better. So are you there today when the next thing happens because there will be another sudden terror? Are you ready to say the Lord is my confidence no matter what you see going on in the world? We need to be because he is. Amen. Amen. And we're sitting here because he brought us through it because we walk with him and he's got us. And so these are things that the Bible is trying to challenge us in. It's time to let go of yourself, let go of your self-evaluation or your ability to do things and your plans of how you're going to get things done and how you're going to prepare for everything. You know, all that stuff is good and has its place. But God is saying, don't miss the good part of this. Don't miss the treasures that you will find spending time with me and my word. If you're not doing that, I challenge you today as a Christian, you've got to dive into God's word and spend time there. And I know some people might say, well, you know, man, you Calvary Chapel people lift up the word so much. Well, it's because that's what's been given to us to instruct us and to guide us. And the Holy Spirit who lives within us, well, he wrote the word. And he's called us to live by the word. OK, amen. And uh, I think, uh, well, I'm out of time. It doesn't matter. So we'll pick it up next week and continue. Bow your heads with me now. Father, thank you for this day you've given and the word that you've given. Lord, I pray that you would continue to work it in us, that it would continue to produce fruit, that none of it that was sown would be lost or stolen. And I pray that you would be with us as we leave this place, that you would go before us to direct our path this week, Lord God, in our homes, the vehicles, the marketplaces, the classrooms, the jobs, and all of the things that we must do, um, Lord, that you would be with each one of us. We love you, and we thank you this morning. Hey, before you leave, head bowed, eyes closed. Hey, somebody not saved this morning, you don't know Christ, 
and you want to settle that, raise your hand. He loves you, died on the cross for you, would love to save you right now. It's something that he and only he can do. And if you feel that tug inside of you, then he wants to forgive you of, of your sin. He wants to uh, save you and pour his spirit into your life and give you the newness of life. Uh, it's a miracle that Jesus Christ does and has been doing for the last 2,000 years. And he would love to do this morning. So if anyone in this room is not saved, you don't know Christ, then boldly be honest about it and raise your hand that you can receive him. Father, we love you. We thank you today. And in Jesus' name, we pray and say together, y'all, amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing.